Welcome to the Bicurian Podcast, where we explore and embrace the seeming contradictions of life. What actually is Bicurian, you ask? Well, you may not necessarily have a mental concept of Bicurian, personally, maybe because it's a made up word. You embody it. What's happening right now in terms of the divisions between us is a focus on that which is different. And lack of understanding and empathy for people's beliefs is no longer an excuse. And it is in the differences we carry in ourselves that we find the Bicurian moment. When you really dig into something, you're going to see some depth to it. It's not just a race thing. It's not just a conservation thing. It's letting go of the or to make room for the and. We embrace all of you. Welcome to the Vicarium. Welcome to the Vicarium podcast. I am Maisela. And I am Eric. And we're very excited to have Jill Teachin. Did I say that correctly? It's Teachin, yes. Teachin, yes. I love it. Um, on our show today, uh, Jill is the uh, force behind her story, a timeline of how women changed America. And um, well, I'd love to have you share a little bit about yourself, and then we can kind of get into uh, more of the conversation. Absolutely. I'm happy to do so. Actually, I spent 40 years as a practicing electrical engineer in the electric utility industry. And along the way, I was very involved in the Society of Women Engineers and began nominating women for awards and finding out about historical women in science, technology, engineering, and math. As I nominated them for awards, I found out that very few women historically had gotten national awards, and that became part of my mission. And then that evolved into writing books about historical women, not just in science, technology, engineering, and math, but across all fields of endeavor because I found out how few books there actually are about women in history and about how little women are talked about in our history textbooks. So that's now what I'm doing is being an advocate for women and writing them back into history. Yeah, that, that's amazing. I'm, I, uh, I looked into a little bit of what you've done and amazing uh, work on your part. So thank you very much for that. How um, have you seen... Uh, people receive that, like in both in like STEM, but also outside of that. Well, one of the most ex fun experiences that relates to your question that I've had was in 2004, I did something called a Google connected classroom. And it is that Google. And I don't believe they do it anymore. But at that point in time, I had a person from Google. We all had microphones and cameras and a fifth grade class in Florida and an eighth grade class in North Carolina. And the topic was Amazing Moms Through History. It was for Mother's Day 2014. I picked 10 women who were mothers. The kids in the class, the students in the class had the opportunity to research some of them. They actually presented their results during the Google Connected Classroom. And then at the end, I asked them what they had learned. And none of the girls were brave enough to answer that question. So the only people that responded were the boys. And the boys said things like, I learned to respect women. I learned that women have contributed to history and that we should treat them fairly. I've learned that women made significant contributions to our history that I didn't know about, and they should be treated equally. And I said to Google, wow. If that is the reaction I'm going to have from doing this kind of work, I don't care how much work it was because it was so much work, but that's where we need to go as a society to value everyone in society. Wow. Yeah, that sounds really powerful. And I, I know that when I first talked to you about this, it was sort of in a certain way, that awareness, when you talked about writing women back into history, that awareness that, you know, there's a modern sort of weirdness, I don't know, where we, we have, like you said, we've written women out of history. We also seem to underestimate women or we limit them it, it reflexively. I wouldn't say that we as kind of a 
a made-up thing because obviously there's nobody like standing in front of people for the most part saying no. But there's this the cultural reflex to to question the the female contribution. And then when you were talking about saying, you know, maybe we could address the gender wars a little bit differently if we just acknowledge that a lot of the stuff that we're saying we like women to be able to participate in, they actually already have a lot. <laughs> like it's not new. <laughs> Well, I'm just going to bring one example into this conversation. And your your listeners don't necessarily, or our listeners, whomever, don't necessarily know that we are all using computers and electronic equipment to have this conversation. Admiral Grace Murray Hopper developed the computer compiler. That is the computer software that allows us to talk to computers in human languages and not just the zeros and ones that a computer understands. So she facilitated the entire computer and information age. And isn't it important that we as a society know that? In addition, there's another woman that I know her, well, I knew her, she's not alive anymore. Her name was Yvonne Brill. All of the communication satellites that are aloft use her engine. So we are totally indebted to the communication that you and I are having right now to these two women to enable us to do that. And isn't it important for us as a society to know that and to acknowledge that and to understand that? Yeah, absolutely. I come from a physics background and I will say that, you know, Madame Curie was one figure that we all had to study and know. And I can't think of a single other woman that that was in that realm. And and and, and actually now that I am thinking about it, I'm curious why her in particular. So maybe turning this around what is the reason you think people um, you know, leave women out of this conversation in your opinion? Well, let's go back to Madame Curie for a moment. In 1987, when my colleague Alexis Swoboda from the Society of Women Engineers came back to Denver, where I live, and said, Jill, I have heard about this outreach program. It will help us recruit women and men, actually, or boys and girls, to engineering. And it's a great women in engineering and science essay contest. And we're going to do it on great women in engineering and science. And I said, Alexis, that's a great idea. And then I said, to your point, who are they? Because in 1987, <laughs> I only knew one historical woman in engineering and science anywhere in the world, and that was Marie Curie. Marie Curie won two Nobel Prizes. I mean, what she did was incredibly significant. She had a came to the U.S. on a tour. She was lauded. She was given radium to do her experiments. I mean, on and on and on. So we do know her, and, and you can't minimize her contributions. She won two Nobel Prizes very, very early. And I think that, well, all right. So to your question, when the pilgrims came over, when people came and settled Jamestown, which is near where I'm originally from in Virginia, they brought with them English common law. That's the foundation of American society, the large majority of it, English common law, under which women are what are called what is called civilly dead and have no rights. Women are not people, women are property. And so that's what the women in 1848 at the first Women's Rights Convention were fighting. They were fighting the fact that women didn't have the right to vote. Women didn't have the right to own property. Women didn't have the right to an education. Women didn't have the right to a divorce. And women didn't have the right to custody of their children in the case of a divorce. And we're still, I mean, we haven't even gotten to 100 years of women having the right to vote. So that's all part of this story and by the way because women didn't have the right to an education they were writing the history books mm -hmm. and when they're not writing the history books they're not written into history Ooh, that makes sense yeah i i it makes total sense and it's sad <laughs> 
But I, I feel like, you know, again, thank you for what you're doing because mm-hmm. I think this is how that gets shifted. And it is just as simple as talking about what women have done to start normalizing what they will do. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that I think is really important is to acknowledge that highlighting the contributions of women, while obviously that has a benefit to women, it actually has a benefit to everybody because people, we are, as human beings, we are easily influenced by what we see. And so if we if we see a world in which women don't do science or innovation or, you know, contribute in certain ways, it is easy, especially as a young person, to sort of set yourself to, oh, that's not my path. Like, you have to be very driven in that way. And so folks who might have something to offer, women who might have something to offer, who maybe aren't driven necessarily, but if they were exposed to those opportunities or possibilities could be inspired they aren't going to be unless we get that information out there. And and then whatever they contribute is going to benefit, as you said, you know, a computer compiler, everybody. <laughs> like <laughs> like it's it's not a small thing. And and I know, you know, I grew up in a very conservative world and I definitely had some some things I had to overcome. I also grew up in a modern world where there were a lot of uh conversations and I was around a lot of strong women. So I had some ideas about the possibilities that existed. And I just know that isn't everybody's situation. Like you, you know what you know, and you think you know what's available, but there's always more to learn. And there, and the more opportunities that we give people to see the possibilities, the more we're going to see in our society. It, it, it only benefits all of us. You're exactly correct. It only benefits all of us. And there is a saying, you can't be what you can't see, but, and that's true for very, very many people. You're right. Some people are so driven and have been for actually a couple hundred years that they, the women particularly, that they're able to do it in spite of Mm -hmm. the fact they didn't see somebody else doing it. And you're also reminding me of two other major topics. One, In the 1980s, there was a series of ads that were in the magazines of the day, like Time and Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report. And there were two sets of baby booties. One was a blue set of baby booties, and one was a pink set of baby booties. And the thrust of the advertisement was, we're not training those pink baby booties to be scientists and engineers And what if the cure for cancer is in those pink baby booties? It was one of my favorite ads of all time. Mm -hmm. And then, and then to, uh, to another point that you're making, my first, her story book is called her story, a timeline of the women who changed America, which is more than 850 women from 1587 to 2011 across all fields of endeavor, women we should know about and that we don't know about. And then my newest book is really to your your point about seeing women. It's called Hollywood, Her Story, an Illustrated History of Women in the Movies. Do you know that in a typical crowd scene in a movie, 80% of the people are men? Do you know that there's less than a third of the main characters in movies that are women? Directors of movies, of the top 100 movies, I don't know exactly the right number or the right percentage. I just know that it's about 4% of movies are directed by women. And then there's there's a test. It's called the Bechdel test, B-E-C-H-D-E-L. I'm familiar and with it. <laughs> you're familiar yeah. with it? But share it, please, oh. for our listeners. It's a great... Well, I mean, it's, it's just so... I, When you hear what it is and then you realize how many movies don't pass it, you just go, what? There have to be two female characters in the movie. They have to have names and they have to talk to each other about something other than a man. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty low bar. (laughs) And an amazing percentage of the movies don't pass it. So when you say... We in society have to see these, we have to see women in roles. It's not just that we have to know them. We are being influenced in a 
fairly negative way mm -hmm. by movies and television where all of the leaders are men, all of the main characters are men, the movies are directed by men, the, the movies are produced by men. This is a gross overstatement, but it's a stereotypical statement. And so women's point of view isn't being presented, women's stories aren't being presented. Well, so how can a, a five-year-old or an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old know differently if that's not what she or he sees? Right. Well, and the phenomenon, the Bechdel test also points out where there are movies with strong, usually it has a, a strong female character who is completely isolated from all other women. And there's this message, um, and you see it a lot, actually, in, in social situations, it plays out with like, oh, you're, you're a special woman, so you can be in our group, not like those other women. And it's a, it's a really interesting way that it it actually subtly pits women against each other because you, know, you get to be the special woman. You can hang out with the guys. You have to be objectified sexually and you have to be super like physically capable of hurting people. Usually <laughs> that's kind of the trope. Yes. Right? And and you, you can't actually be close to any other women. So you'd say they have to basically act like a man. They have to act like a man that the men want to have sex with who have big breasts like i mean can't be gay i mean we have, yeah i'm just saying like it's a really interesting phenomena and i'm assuming you're familiar with misrepresentation the yes. documentary and so that was a documentary that i saw a few years ago i believe it's still available on netflix and the truly intriguing thing that i got from that was that women in movies in the 30s and 40s actually had a much wider character range the same woman could be the seductress and the girl next door whereas modern movies they're much more two-dimensional like they, they get put into like if, if you're the best friend you're never ever going to be romantically interesting <laughs> to anyone of <laughs> note in the character in the in the movie and same thing like if you're sexually attractive you're not really going to be somebody's friend as far as like the women are separated out in that way well, in modern movies uh, yeah absolutely I mean, unless of course the storyline is the guy striking out at which point the storyline is still still written around how we would feel for him um, pursuing, and, and I mean that becomes the basis of rom coms because the guy might pursue and pursue and pursue, and then finally she relents or something. Right. So now it's it's actually fascinating doing the research for Hollywood her story. We found out Barbara Bridges and my co-author and I that in the founding of the industry, women did everything. They were directors and producers, and they wrote, and they edited, and they were the camera operators, and they did everything. In the 19-teens, a woman was the highest paid actor, male or female. A woman was the highest paid director, male or female. So women were instrumental in the founding of the film industry, like, by the way, they were in the founding of the computer industry. And then something happened. Do you know it, what happened or? Oh, I know what happened in the movie industry. In what? the movie industry, unions got introduced in the 1920s and movies started making money. Gotcha. Is it always money? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's I almost it's money and power. I, you know? <laughs> well, that, that brings up an interesting thing because, and this can be applied to women, uh, race, sexuality. I do feel like you can look back in history and you see the pendulum swings farther out, right? But then the pushback on it can be immense. I mean, in the time you've been doing this, have you noticed that? I certainly have in a lot of areas regarding like LGBT rights, um, race, things like that. Like I, I felt like in the 2000s, we were getting towards a certain amount of, of tolerance and acceptance and, and things were starting to like look better and in the last couple of years we seem to be regressing in those w w what are your thoughts on that i do agree that we seem to be regressing i just am incredibly hopeful that this is the kind of the last gasp i'm not sure how long the last gasp is going to last until we actually get to a place where there is greater acceptance across all of gender, race, sexual orientation, ability or, or disability. Uh, I have a very good friend who has spina bifida and listening to him and finding out about 
the assumptions that are made about him by people who simply look at him. And so um, I, have to, I have to be optimistic. I'm an optimistic person, but that doesn't mean that I'm not gonna work as hard as I possibly can to get the message out of the value of women and to society, to all people, so that we can start changing this conversation so that it's not, you know, it's not always a surprise to learn that a woman invented the square bottom paper bag, the grocery bag. It's not a surprise to learn, you know, that a woman invented the computer compiler. Right. Or that a woman did anything that women did, which are very, very many things. That a woman developed the APGAR score. Anyone that has had a baby that's probably listening to this podcast that baby had a test administered at one minute and five minutes after birth. It's called the APGAR score. Huh. And nobody knows it's a zero to 10 score. And nobody knows that it's Dr. Virginia APGAR that developed the score. Wow. And I don't even think, I mean, nobody even thinks that it, it never crosses anyone's mind that it might be a woman. And, and we, need, we need to change that conversation. Yeah. When I know, um, when I was in college, that was when there was a push to stop saying men as a plural for women and men. And it was interesting to me to remember, you know, at that time, of course, that's what I had grown up with. So I, I perfectly considered that to be normal, right? Like when people say all men, they mean men and women. And, and then I was, I'm in my college class and my professor's talking about how they need to change it. And to be honest, I was like, I don't even know why, who cares, right? Because it's, once again, it's my experience. And she said, and, and I, there's, I or someone else in the class raised our hand and they said, but we know it means all, all means men and women. So why, why are we worrying about this? And she said, well, let's try this. Like all men should breastfeed their babies. All men <laughs> should, should use tampons or whatever. And, and, and you could see people getting really uncomfortable. She said, do you really think it means men and women when I say it like that? And we're like, no, <laughs> it was a really helpful, but it's, I feel like the, that's part of what I see us dealing with in terms of this conversation around gender is that I don't think I'm alone in having, you know, being raised in an environment that did this and kind of it's normalized. And so it doesn't, so then when someone's talking about it, it, there takes a minute to kind of figure out like, oh, this is why it matters. Like it matters because there are, there are kids out there, there are booties out there that came out badly, my premier cancer art article, but <laughs> that could be discovering the cure to something. For cancer, right. It if could they be pink felt, baby booties. Right, right. If they felt like that was a path for them. And there are lots of people who are capable of being internally driven to see what isn't possible and and most of us do need a little bit more um, guidance or at least, you know, some options to to kind of get inspired by. And so like, but helping people understand why it matters, I think is really important as well. Like that you were saying, that's why I loved when you were talking about like writing women back into history. Like let's, let's, let's actually start from, from a, a realistic place. Like right now we're living in a fictional world that doesn't include these contributions, that it doesn't include the things that happened. Let's start there and then have the conversation about how we want to include people or what it looks like to have a gender equi equitable society or, you know, but from a place of actually knowing what happened. Right. It, and, and it's actually so important. I'm, I'm also doing series of her story books for countries in Africa and to go to an African country where they tell you before you go, and so you know it when you get there, we, we don't value women in our society. Um, and, and the UN, the United Nations, has found out that when you start educating girls, that provides, I think the number is around 20%, I think it's 17%, bump up in the gross national product of those countries because of the skills and capabilities of those women that are now utilized to the benefit of that country. I mean, it is only for the betterment of society as a whole 
that we begin to, that we value women, that we place a value on women. It's better for all of us. You know, it, it's not that, and I know that some people feel this way, some people feel threatened. If, if women have opportunities, then the opportunities are gonna be fewer for men. But what in fact happens is it's like the tide rising. It raises all the boats. Women make economic contributions. They start businesses. They do all kinds of things that raises society up and betters it for everyone. Yeah. Absolutely. So obviously you've done your part. What do you think other people can do to help with this situation? Like what's what's an average thing that we can do every day? Well, one of the things that we each can do is we can start thinking about another area that I've worked in, which is called unconscious biases. And I'm just going to give you one example. In the U.S., and I don't remember what all the numbers are right now, but I'm just going to make some up. So it's about 15% of men are over six feet tall. And it's about 4% of men that are over six feet, two inches tall. Yet, 60% of American business CEOs are over six feet tall. So so one of the things, I have to do this actually myself, is I will look at women who I know are leaders, and then I will say to myself, Jill, you have to remember that these women are leaders. Just because they're not six feet two men, they are still leaders. And I'm 5'2". You know, I'm not getting any taller. All that's going to happen is I'm going to get shorter. And so, <laughs> so, and I'm a leader. But I have this, I have it, I've been socialized that six feet tall men are leaders. So, right. and, it, and it goes across everything. We need to open up our minds, be aware that we have these biases, and make sure that we're making decisions in all areas of our lives that recognize these these thoughts that we have. Yeah, that is absolutely true. It, it's funny that you mentioned that only because something that Isla has said to me, and she's she's been in a lot of leadership roles, and and she's not tall, but same kind of a thing. She's literally used the words to me. She's like, I think people think I'm taller than I am. Oh, no. <laughs> people do. Actually, my, I have run into this. My, my friends, I'm like you, I'm five, two, well, and a half, but <laughs> because that half inch matters. But over the course of my life, the number of times that I'll be talking to a friend of mine who's much taller, five, seven, five, eight, five, nine, and we'll talk about something and I'll say, well, you know, because I'm short. And they're like, well, no, no, you're my height, right? And like, you're five seven. You have five inches on me. How do you not know I'm five two? But most of the time, unless I'm standing right next to them or I make a point of it, they think I'm their height. I don't know why. <laughs> but, wow, that is that is just fascinating. It, it, it's it's relevant just because you brought that up, and I'm like, that is a conversation we've had. <laughs> yeah, and and it's and it's true. I've been in. A, I've run multiple organizations and been in a lot of leadership situations. And I don't know, I, I have told people somehow I've managed to convince people that I'm tall <laughs> and I wonder, if, and I don't know like what it is, but and I don't it's wear heels. You're a leader. It's because you're a leader. So therefore you have to be tall. I have to be tall. <laughs> how we envision it in our society. There you go. They, they just, they realized it. So they decided I was taller because I don't even wear heels or anything. Like they bad for my hips. So so I'm always just my height. (laughs) Right. And I have a reconstructed knee, so I don't wear them either. So anyhow, right. Thanks. The other question I wanted to put Eric on the spot Um, as a, Uh as a male bodied human who my experience of of Eric is that he's actually not threatened by strong women and not just me. (laughs) I I am unique in that from what I can tell. he, He tends to, to really value and appreciate uh, women specifically, honestly, in his life who are um, decisive and, and leaders. And, 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 and so I'm just curious if that's just an instinct or if there's something, if there's work you've done or because, I mean, I feel like perhaps that's something that could help 
with this, like where you were talking about how to how to see this differently. Part of it, I'm I'm going to admit, and this harkens back to an episode we did um, in the past where um, we talked about positive masculinity and that seeing that phrase implies that I've had plenty of experience with negative masculinity. To to be honest, many of the women that I have worked with that were my boss or um, running the show at, at a concert or different things like that, my wife, we have, I have just always had a certain amount of respect for the way in which they get things done. And it isn't necessarily done in the way that I've seen a lot of alpha males do it. I've learned to appreciate, and this is a massive societal change, that alpha male is not necessarily um, going to get the job done at all <laughs> or possibly better. So uh, I just learned to really appreciate that aspect of the the female mentality is, is a lot less concerned about whatever kind of contest is going on in masculine culture. And I'm I'm going to guess also, and I don't know, but somewhere along the way, you were, there was a role model for you, or there was behavior demonstrated in some way that didn't, well, I, I could do it the negative way or the positive way. <laughs> we'll do, I'm going to do it the negative way, that didn't belittle women, that yeah. didn't constantly demean women that didn't do all of those kinds of things so that in fact you were taught respect for women i was raised primarily by my mother who had remarried um but was very much the person in charge in my family dynamics growing up yeah. um you know and she was never one to aspire to be a ceo she she worked as a secretary for um, a couple of companies while I was growing up and actually spent the first several years until I was about eight or nine at home with me and then went back to work. But realistically, yeah, she, she got things done, showed me how to get it done. It was never, um, the competitiveness that I saw in my classmates and that sort of thing. It was just, here's how we're going to do it. Yeah. So you, you were, you were socialized, I would say, uh, appropriately. <laughs> well, you know, exactly. And, and, and my stepfather who was, you know, in the picture was never one to really question that. So he had been socialized in a similar way. He, he was never really into challenging my mom. He basically, she ran, she, she wore the pants as it were. Right. Right. And but, she was tall, obviously. <laughs> and, and there are other people, there are other men who do have similar experiences to you or do have similar outlooks to yours and demonstrate similar behavior. And I'm not going to guess what the percentage is, but we all know that it's way less than half. Yeah. 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 Okay. No. And, and, and I mean, personally, you know, if I could just flip a switch and change things, it would at least be to create a world in which people could see things the way I do, which is a little bit less about gender and about how things work. Um, just respecting people in general. I mean, I do think we need to push the pendulum really far with the work you're doing. We need to, you know, push into recognition and putting effort into getting people seen. And, and eventually we might end up where people it's, it's my, it's inherent in me. I just don't think about the gender of the person that I'm working with or talking to, or who's running this show, unless I tend to notice if it's negative masculinity. Right. And, and see, I'm just thinking about some of the, some of the times I go into places and I count. So, or I see something and I count. So I, I subscribe to the Wall Street Journal and there are ad pages where there are conferences that are coming up and they have speakers or there are, um, sometimes there are advertisements taken out that are our, our top sellers or whatever it happens to be, and I count. Because often there are so few women on those pages that it actually then becomes totally obvious or people of color or find another demographic yeah. that's not represented. And so that means that that picture that's being presented is almost a completely male picture. And, and that's just not life. Right, exactly. And that's and I'll just echo what Eric said. That's why 
I think what you're doing is so important. I think that so many people are going to benefit from women being written back in and, and all of us kind of getting some openness around what the possibilities are. So thank you for taking that on. I, you know, I'm really excited to, I read, I was looking at your website and reading your fun facts. We're going to link to that because I think people will enjoy it. Yeah. So um, before we wrap up, is there anything you're currently doing right now you'd like to share? Anything um, people can go and take a look at specifically on your website or other places? Well, I have multiple websites. Um, One is www.hollywoodherstory.com, which is my latest book. It's actually an incredibly beautiful book. It tells a very important story. And I'm hoping that it will help change the movie industry along the lines that we've discussed already in this podcast. And then HerStoryAtimeline.com actually has educational resources available for people, as well as book club discussion guidelines that people can use to better assimilate and learn the information that's in the book. Wonderful. Yeah, we'll share links to all of that in our show notes for this. Mm -hmm. And and I'm working on her story, Africa. I've been to Africa. There are places where we really do need to get the word out that women have a lot of value and can contribute significantly to society. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to reading it. Yeah, thanks thank for being you. on the show. And, and we would love to have you back. So Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's fun for me. I'd love to be back. Great. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the Bikerian Moment. I am so excited to share mine. What is that? Well, it's not actually a happy or exciting thing, so I'm not sure why I'm so excited. But uh, there's a New New York Times article today or yesterday about Justify, which was the last horse to win the Triple Crown, uh, which, as you know, I have some strong draw to that. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, so apparently Justify failed a drug test um af- when they when the the colt ran the santa anita derby yes which is what qualified justified to run in the kentucky derby right and um i read this article i'm familiar with it too and it's in and, and the whole thing is i mean it's a little sketchy in that you know like one of the people on the board that reviews a drug test that kind of did the weird thing and didn't announce it has a stake in some of the horses that the trainer who's who was training justify um owns so there's like there's a lot of uh um connection in the in the i guess in the horseback horse riding and uh industry horse racing industry and and so it, it was rough for me in that it kind of bummed me out, uh, you know, especially this, the, the derby this year was so weird in that the, you know, the horse that won the race was then disqualified, which has literally never happened. And then, and then reading this about justify from last year. And it's also something I was thinking about, you know, cause you're such a tour de France, uh, fanatic fan enthusiast. I'm not sure, but <laughs> obsessor. Yes. But, uh, you know, I started thinking about it with that and the the ways that, you know, athletes are and obviously horse athletes are getting called out for for doping. And it, it just caused me to real, really question, like, where is that line between self-abuse? Like most most ex- uh, elite athletes abuse their bodies in a variety of ways to be successful. Like, you know, they have a lot of you know damage from the training they do. And we as a society have drawn the line of that abuse around the use of drug enhancements, yeah, which I'm not going to say is a bad thing, but it's just interesting to me that that is the line that we have. And also that, you know, it seems to be coming up to me. It seems like it's coming up a lot. And I'm just wondering, like, have we maybe reached the point which we can do more without something like that? Like, have we, have we sort of discovered unenhanced 
success? Or is it just more people are getting caught cheating? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's tough to say. I don't think the chemicals were available um, in so much. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is science and, and technology has come a long way. Um, this actually piggybacks on because I was going to piggyback onto your Bicurian moment with mine to talk about baseball and and maybe what some of the motivation here might have been. Uh, in the late 90s in baseball, a couple of players admitted to using anabolic steroids, which had not actually technically been banned in the sport because they were too new. And what's interesting about it is that the public backlash on it was pretty strong, and yet it was generally the highest rating time for a sport like baseball, which, you know, we assume is the American pastime. It's been there forever since the late 1800s, right? But it had been slumping in the ratings, and it, and it has always bounced around. But this time period, these people were doing amazing things, hitting a lot of home runs. It was exciting to watch. And in some ways, you have to ask yourself, like, is that what we want? I mean, are we are, are they turning a blind eye to things like Justify and in some of these sports, you know, to to increase ratings and stuff? It's it's a scary, weird, slippery slope. But in general, yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff is new. I mean, in cycling, the cheating that was most prevalent that wasn't chemical enhancements was doping your blood, training really, really hard. And then doing a blood draw, basically just like donating blood into a bag and saving that. And then the day of a race, you would do a transfusion and add that blood back in. And it had more red blood cells and a higher capacity to carry oxygen. It's, it, it's called blood doping. You're not actually doing anything with any kind of external chemical, but you are giving yourself an enhancement. And in cycling at the time when Lance Armstrong was doing that the most, you wouldn't want to be the racer not doing it. You were just going to embarrass yourself. Well, and I'll just say it sounds so gross that I'm like, if somebody really is that committed, I'm not sure I'm going to (laughs) say. I mean, somebody in 2016, I think it was, and not at the Tour de France, but at another big race, um, used blood that was a month old and had probably been mistreated and gave himself toxic shock. All right, so there's risks. I mean, a a question that actually um, my partner brought up was if if people are doing this and we know they're doing it we already have like different classifications like there's gender splits and age splits you know and even that like you have the gender thing um there's that woman from i want to say an african country that that is a track and field um star and they literally checked to see if she had a penis like because she was so much better and faster well, and they also didn't use. I thought you said because you were telling me this that they did a blood draw or something, and she had like high. So, so they found out no, she's actually really a woman. She just happens to have really high testosterone. Yeah, it's a genetic thing. I won't even say defect, but they had her basically have to reduce her her amount of testosterone to an acceptable level amongst her competition in order to level the playing field. And her argument, right or wrong, is. This is the body that I a had. god or yeah. science or whatever gave her, right? But not enhanced in any way. So right. she's a better athlete out of the box. Yeah. Then why should she have to in some way hinder out herself? Oh. <laughs> out of the packaging. Out of the packaging. But well, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're right. Like we are to a place where now, like we are pushing the human body to the limits well, why not have a category that's enhancements? Like, I mean, it's, you, you instead could. of instead of saying, like, you could it could be like the difference between you know amateur and professional, or it could be that you know you go in and and you you disclose how you're pushing your body. Primarily, <laughs> here's the problem: that's that's an equally slippery slope because none of the chemical enhancements, like steroids and things like that, that will give you an edge now, are good for you long term. But that you've heard yeah. about roid rage. Um, it causes swelling of certain areas of the body and shrinkage in other areas. There's, there's no positives to it. It's it's not a good thing. It literally gives you a benefit as an athlete over a short period of time, and the health risks are actually very high. Th- there's a mm-hmm. reason why nobody's running out and buying anabolic steroids over the counter when they're not competing. 
because it's not worth the risk. Okay. You, you increase your chance of cancer. W- one of the things about Lance Armstrong, um, and I learned this in a documentary about Lance Armstrong, that I didn't even realize. Of course, he's well known for coming back as a cancer survivor when he had testicular cancer and becoming competitive basically with one testicle post-cancer. And that was his entire career from the late 90s through the 2000s, early 2000s. And when he was doing the blood doping and all of that, what they pointed out that I did not know ahead of time was that the reason he likely had testicular cancer was due to steroid use. Hmm. So he was always a cheater. And in the process of cheating, gave himself a condition that he had to then recover from and then had to cheat more to to be competitive but eventually was like one of the best and that's the thing if you level the playing field in that way that everybody was pretty much doping at that time his whole team was he, literally they were threatening people on his team to get on board or get kicked off the team hmm. with with participating in it and the other teams were all doing it too he really became a big scapegoat for what was fundamentally a problem in the sport gotcha but notably, you ask why not have an enhanced category because then you're going to have a whole bunch of people who had to battle cancer to be competitive that to then need more enhancements to still stay competitive. It's not worth it. That's the reality. None of that, none of those kinds of enhancements are good for you in the long run. Well, um, yes. And m- m- most, honestly, like most competitive elite athletics are not good for you in, in the long term. So, you know, and that, that's my question is, and I don't, I'm not pulling for one thing or the other, more just really asking, like, we're okay with, like I said, like a certain amount of abuse that, that these athletes put themselves under. Like they, you know, they tell stories of joint issues and concussion problems and, you know, whatever it is. And And yes, you're going to deal with things, you know, the concussion thing is, is a little different because that is a long-term effect that causes depression and dangerous situations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm certain that nobody who's played football that's now 50 is walking without some joint aches. And you know what? There's, we have to draw a line of where the acceptable physical risk to engaging in a sport that you love, because here's the thing we know about the big players and they make millions, the average player in most sports. I mean, I think the minimum in football was until recently, if it's not still the same, $640,000 a year. And I know that's a lot of money, but it's not like the millions that the big stars make. Well, and it's also, it's not a guarantee, like, you know, it's three to five years. It's maybe, maybe 10 or 15. Right. And, 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 then, and if that's what you choose to do, I mean, construction workers are hard on their body. Are we going to say they shouldn't be out working? No, exactly. It's just, it's, it's a question I have, like, and I hear what you're saying. I'm not saying we should change that line. And I'm just wondering, like, if, if this is what people are doing, is is there a way to do it safer? Like, if people are actually at a point where they could be, you know, they d- could disclose, like, I want to I want to push my body and I want to enhance it in this way and this sport, that's how I want to do it. And could that could that be something that's monitored or handled differently? I don't know. As a sports purist, I would say no. <laughs> You're like, uh-uh, I'm against this much. Sports, <laughs> to me, harkens back to the ancient Greeks ha- holding the Olympics And competing and showing off their raw prowess with their natural ability. That's what I enjoy watching. But, yeah. I mean, I just don't think enhancing yourself chemically is in the spirit of it, whether even if you made a separate category for it. Yeah. You're reminding me of the the Dead Poets Society. Did you watch that movie? I love that movie. Well, I have to take that back. I used to love that movie. I have problems with it now. However, there's that point where he says, you know, sports and competition are an opportunity for human beings to challenge other human beings to excel. Yeah. And I hear you on that. And that's, I mean, in cycling, that's, that's why I'm a fan of it. I am a cyclist myself. I see what they do. I'm impressed. And I get out on my bike and it makes me want to pedal a little harder. I'm never going to compete with them. Yeah. But it's interesting to think that their experience and my experience out riding up a hill and trying to push through it isn't completely dissimilar. So that's the thing. I, you know, and, and regarding Justify, back to the original point, um, based on what I read, there's a chance, albeit slim, 
that it might have just been in some feed, the chemical that they found. It, it can be an environmental contaminant, as they call it in that sport. Yeah, they said it was unlikely, though. Yeah. Based but, on the levels that he had in his justice and, system. And you know what? I bet you that that was probably one of the most watched years of horse racing last year. So maybe they were motivated to do that. And it's kind of gross. Yeah. So. Well, thanks for listening. I should maybe start out a little happier, huh? Yeah. <laughs> thanks for listening. Join our mailing list at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y backslash by cure b-i-c-u-r and you'll get episodes and blogs conveniently emailed directly to you by me learn more about us at by backslash podcast and if you like what we're doing please tell your friends about us or share episodes you like on social media thanks mm-hmm.